Hey everybody, Keith Tanner here from Fly Miata, and I'm here to talk about coolers today. Um, this is exciting. I'm sure many of you are looking forward to that, but you know what? It's almost, uh, it's in the 90s outside today, so coolers seem a very appropriate topic of conversation. Um, and I'm specifically going to be talking about not engine oil, or not engine coolers, but oil coolers, transmission coolers, differential coolers, why you want them, and have a look at some of the, uh, some of the options that we offer here at Fly Miata. We're giving them some unboxing, just because, you know, our shipping department gave us this nice boxed parts, and so we're going to take apart and ruin all their work. Uh, but first, um, why do we bother putting coolers on the oil? And I'll start with the oil. I'll start talking about engine oil, and then I'll move on to transmission differentials and talk specifically about the NDs, which is why we have this one here in the air behind me. Um, but we'll start off. Yes, see? Hello. Say hi to Andy, everybody. Um, we'll start off talking about engine oil. But the problem, they all share the same problem. Uh, and that is that as oil gets hot, the viscosity drops off. And that's bad because that viscosity is part of what you depend on to keep a film of oil between your metal parts. Um, that film of oil goes away, all of a sudden you have lots of friction, you have lots of heat, which means more friction, which means all of a sudden your rod bearings spin and your rods go out the side of the block. So, bad. Um, our goal here basically is to keep the oil temperatures under control so that they can do their job properly. Um, you know, in a, in a manual transmission, you can even start to have trouble shifting as the viscosity changes and the synchros don't work properly. Uh, in the differential, you find out about when the differential explodes. That's, you know, sort of your surprise when the, uh, when everything goes. Um, so you can, you can actually look up, if you find a really good oil site, you can actually look up viscosity versus temperature and you'll see that it starts off very high viscosity, that's your cold start and then it drops way down and it sort of flattens out a little bit, but it doesn't flatten for quite a long time. It's still dropping pretty quickly in the 200 Fahrenheit range. Um, and we don't want it to, to completely bottom out and, and go very, very thin because generally speaking, if we're pushing our car hard enough that we're heating our oil up beyond design limits, we're also spinning the engine fast and the loads on the rod bearings, for example, go up exponentially with engine speed. So, you know, driving around town at 3000 RPM, you're not putting that much load on those bearings, you're driving on the track at 6,000 RPM, you're putting four times as much load into those bearings. Um, you can do the math, it's all right there, it's kind of fun to play with. So, we offer coolers for engine oil and in some cases for transmission and differential oil. And it's basically, it's just a radiator, effectively. That's all a radiator is, is a, is a fluid to air heat exchanger, and that's what this is too. It's just a very small, cute little radiator. And just like an engine coolant radiator, we also use um, thermostats. And the reason for that is because you want your oil to come up to temperature as quickly as possible. Especially so if you're driving on the street, you start your car when it's minus 20 outside, you want that oil to get up the temp so it can do its job lubricating properly. Um, and you don't want to overcool it while you're doing that. So we have a thermostat that we use. And so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go through these various kits, show off the parts. It's kind of fun. If you have any questions, throw them in the comments. We will do our best to answer them as we go. And I have some questions from people that were placed ahead of time. But yeah, let's walk through a kit and see what's in one of these things. This is, by the way, this is a thermostat. It's worth like, having a good look at this thing. This is kind of cute. This goes underneath the oil filter. So you take your oil filter off, you put this in this place, you screw this little adapter in, and then you put your oil filter on the end there. So when it's cold, the oil is able to go straight through. When it gets hot, there's a spring-loaded device in here that basically closes up and forces the forces the oil to go through, I forget which way it's actually going, um, yeah, to go, to go out to the cooler, come back, and then into the, into the filter. When it's open like it is now, it just bypasses that whole thing completely. Very, very simple device. Um, these are fairly universal. Uh, you, can buy, you can use them on just about every car as long as you have the right adapter, you have the right dimensions, and it physically fits, which it does not always. So, let's open up a box and see what's inside here. You may have noticed we're in a different place today. We are at Brandon's house. We are at Brandon's shop. Um, that is because Brandon had this car taken apart in his lift and we wanted to use it. So we figured let's, uh, let's go over to Brandon's place, give you guys a change of scenery after three months of looking at the chaos that is my shop. Now you see the chaos of someone else's. So let's see how we got. This is an old cooler kit for an NB. This is the, uh, the old cooler kit we offer. There's one of those thermostats. To do to do parts list. Look at this. I'm doing an unboxing video. I feel so influencer esque. 
have a look inside. This is the actual cooler itself. Now we actually had a bit of a challenge designing this particular kit in that everyone's got a slightly different setup on their car and it's hard to find a good place to put the actual cooler on the NAs and MBs specifically. So in this case what we did is we put it sort of in front of the steering rack. Uh, it's down low. Um, it's maybe not the ideal location for, uh, for airflow if you had the ability to you know, put it up on the nose, that sort of thing. But it's a location that's always available. It's a very big box for a very small cooler. Look at that, it looks exactly like that one. Could have saved myself some time. Um, but on these kits, we put them, you probably can't see it very well here, but it sits just in front of an, uh, the, uh, the steering rack. Not on, an ND, not on an ND, which is what we're dealing with here. Um, but this is an indication. If you pretend this is an NA or MB, it will sit right about there. It is fairly well protected unless you drive into something when you're probably going to damage your subframe. Um, we don't recommend damaging your subframe, so we also don't recommend damaging your oil cooler. But if you do have an off and hit something hard, we do recommend you check your oil cooler um, and turn off your engine, just in case. Like I said, it may not be the perfect place to put it, but it is one that is always available. And you can, with a splitter, you can drive some, uh, drive some cool air to it fairly easily. Uh, or you can put a, put a small little notch effectively in your stock um, under tray and feed it some air. Do we have a question over there, Travis? Two good questions. Yes. Uh, one, someone was asking if the gasket and seal was the same as the factory ones. The gasket and seal, I mean this gasket here. This isn't really a replaceable gasket on the factory. You know, every, every oil filter comes with its own. And I, I doubt that this is a standardized part. Um, these things are made by Mocal, and so I expect that this is available as a, as a part. You only disturb this when you are ch when removing or replacing the thermostat itself. Once you've got this installed, um, you have a machine surface there that your oil filter seals up against, and of course your oil filter has its own built-in rubber gasket. So there is no gasket that needs to be renewed in here. Um, if you are taking it off or something gets damaged or for some reason you need to replace it, Mocal, almost definitely has replacement parts for that. Hopefully that answers the question. Question number two, Travis. What is your opinion about water-based oil coolers? Water-based oil coolers. Now that's, that's interesting, and I, I probably should have started going on about this. Um, I guess there's two ways you could do this. You can do a you know, oil to water heat exchanger and then have another heat exchanger somewhere else, which is often how, say, superchargers often do their intercooler, intercooling. Um, but that's complicated. That's, that's a lot of extra plumbing. You're not gaining anything with that other than a little bit of packaging. You still have to put a heat exchanger in the nose somewhere. You've got to get rid of the heat somewhere. So it's a little bit unusual. It's possible that there is some application there that, that does it. Uh, much more common is a coolant to oil heat exchanger. And Mazda has used that on most Miatas. Um, it showed up in 1994 on the 1.8s. Uh, it was on some NCs. It was added on the ND in 2019. Um, and what that is, it's basically, it's, it's very much like one of these, uh, only it has oil running through it and the uh, oil and coolant running through it so it can exchange heat between the two of them. And my opinion is that these are primarily exist to help warm up the, temp warm up the car faster uh, because your coolant comes up, the heat, comes up the temperature before your oil does. And so I think they're not so much oil coolers as oil warmers. Um, on a really cold day, your coolant comes up to 200 degrees or 180, whatever your thermostat temperature is, fairly quickly. Your oil is much slower to come up. And so what you're doing then is you're using that heat from the coolant to sort of supercharge the, uh, well, not supercharge, a bad choice in this particular uh, group of, or this particular audience, but it, it, it increases the rate of heat transfer into the oil to bring it up to temperature. Once everything's up to temperature, it keeps the coolant and the oil in the same range. And the thing is, if you're running your car hard enough that your oil temps are starting to go up, you're also probably seeing your coolant temperatures going up. So having the two of them talk to each other and, and, and bounce the heat back and forth is not really helping very much. Um, what you really need to do is get another way to get rid of some of that heat, and that's what these separate oil heat exchangers do, is they take heat from the oil and they get rid of it without involving the coolant system at all. More questions, Travis? We might have a few on this one. Well, there might be uh, some few. So asking where we recommend putting an oil temperature sensor to best monitor the oil temperatures with the kit. 
Best place to put an oil temperature sensor. That's, a, that's actually a popular one. There's a bunch of places you can theoretically put them. A lot of oil cooler kits, not ours, but a lot of them will combine the oil cooler with an oil filter relocation kit. Um, our oil filter relocation kit has a temperature sensor bung on it. Um, I don't like doing that because you cannot use a thermostat on the system. Um, I prefer to have an oil cooler system and a remote. If you really must have a remote uh, oil filter, then it's a separate system. Um, in my opinion, and I'm sure there's going to be very strongly voiced opinions that, don't, that disagree with this, I think it doesn't really matter exactly where you put it as long as you know where it sits when the oil is at its regular temperature. Because the oil is constantly circulating. So even if you put it at the bottom of the sump, for example, the bottom of the oil pan, that oil will, you know, as, as the oil in the entire system heats up, that will heat up as well. You might not see, you know, it might happen 30 seconds earlier somewhere else in the engine, but that doesn't matter because you're not going to be responding that quickly to overheating oil. Um, it doesn't move that fast. So as long as you have it in a place where you do see, you know, where, you know what is normal that will give you a fairly good indication of what's, uh, of what's going on. That's my personal opinion on it. I'm sure there are others who disagree violently with it. Yes, Travis. On that same note, someone wants clarification. Will this work with our FM relocation kit or not? Yes. The question is, will, will our oil filter kit work with our, relocation, um, our cooling kit? It will. Uh, you basically end up with an adapter stacked on top of this one. Um, the, the adapter that goes to the remote oil filter kit, regardless of who made it, but of course FlyMat is our preferred vendor of choice, um, sits on top of this and runs the, the oil over to the relocation kit and runs back in again. So it's effectively a very long, skinny uh, oil filter with extra hoses on it. Uh, I believe there is one, in one application where on the 2001 to 05 cars, you end up with a fair stack of adapters on there. But I believe we've solved that clearance problem. We ran into it years ago, but I think it's been sorted out. Um, that information is all on the website. If, if there is a clearance problem, if there is an uh, incompatibility that we know about, we do put it on the website. Uh, <laughs> so here's some of the theory talking about the, uh, the various filters. I'm just going to run through the last couple of pieces we have. Um, you know, the hoses that we use are not ones that you need to assemble yourself. They're uh, Fergolas, um, good, quality, good quality hoses with crimped on ends on them. Um, we try to keep them as short as we can because we want to minimize pressure loss. And of course, little laser cut CNC bent um, brackets that will fit whatever the specific application is you're dealing with. So that wasn't really all that exciting, but there we go. Oh, and look at this, adapters. Some of these things are so cool. And all the various adapters you need. Uh, we had someone ask if yes. we were going to offer or could sell longer hoses so people could put it in a different location than what we recommend. Um, if you want to put the cooler in a different location, feel free. Uh, the, the reason we went with the location we did again was because of consistency in packaging. Uh, we found that before we came up with that kit mounting it on the steering rack, um, we were building them for customer cars and every single one was different in terms of who had what heat exchanger or a space between the headlight. And, you know, our old track dog race car actually had an enormous oil cooler where the headlight used to sit with a NACA duct, a submerged duct on the, uh, on the headlight lid, dumping huge amounts of air into this thing. It was all closed off. Very, very sexy, very, very effective. Um, very difficult to see at night because there was your headlight. So obviously difficult to put into production. So yes, if you want to use a different hose, these are standardized um, fittings. These are sixes, eights a dash 8 AN line. Um, so you can get these in whatever length you want to. You can make your own lengths and feel free to put the hose where you'd like. We offer it as a kit with this one length because that's a length that we know works. If you want something different, you're on your own doing the engineering on that one. Yes, Travis. Lots of questions. Lots. Next question is, are there any issues with the direction they install the feed lines? Do they have to be installed up or down? Ah, that's actually an important question. And um, I have blown up a transmission because one time I installed one of these things upside down. And the problem with that is they drain when you, uh, when you turn off the pumps. And the transmission ones are run by pumps. But this can fool you on your oil level. Uh, if, you're, if your cooler drains when the engine's not running, then you check your oil level and it's here. And then you start the engine up and the oil level goes, sucks down again. And all of a sudden, you've got less oil in your sump than you thought you had. 
So you don't want them to drain themselves. It's a bad idea. You want them this way up so that they stay full of oil. It makes it a little bit more of a pain in the butt at oil change time because you can either choose to simply not change the oil that's in the cooler or you can take it off, turn it upside down, pour it out. Or you can, if you're really feeling adventurous, you put some very low pressure air in one of the lines and blow it out and you will make the world's biggest mess. Doesn't work. There is no such thing as two, as a low enough air pressure to do that. I have tried it. Um, enormous, enormous mess. Anyhow, yeah, you definitely, you, it does matter which way up they go. Because if you do it this way up and you let it drain, then you're always going to have the wrong amount of oil in your sump, in your transmission, in your diff, because you're not going to be able to measure it accurately. Travis, more questions? Lots of questions. Lots of questions. Um, questions good. So these two are kind of related, so I'm going to kind of combine them into one. Okay. Uh, the first one is what oil temperatures should people expect to see in a car and what temperature is too high? Yeah, um, you're never going to see your oil temperatures lower than your thermostat temperature for your coolant. That's pretty much what it comes down to. The oil is never going to be cooler than the coolant is. So if you have a you know, 190 degree thermostat, you're going to see at least 190 degrees on the, uh, on the oil temp. Um, you know, the absolute red line, oil doesn't, it doesn't all of a sudden turn into water. Like I said, the, uh, the actual viscosity sort of levels off. Somewhere around 240-ish, it levels off. Um, but what really happens when you get too hot, you also start, your seals start getting in trouble. At about 300 degrees, you start losing your rubber seals. They get softened, and they start dumping oil out. Then you've got less oil, and, well, it's, it's not a virtuous circle. We'll put it that way. 240-ish um, is probably what I would aim for at, as, a, as a red line. Um, it's one of those things where if you can get it to stabilize, you're in pretty good shape. And have a look at the oil that you are using. Um, if you are using a particular formulation, see if you can find out what its viscosity versus temperature range is. Uh, Redline Oil, for example, has some very good technical information on their website on exactly how hot is too hot. Um, and, I'm, and again, this is the sort of thing where I'm sure there's a bunch of people going, oh, well, I was told by my daddy that you can never have oil over 200 degrees. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not a hard red line where it just all of a sudden goes wrong. If it starts climbing and keeps climbing, you have a problem. And again, you're also using this oil cooler to bring down some of your engine temperatures as well. So it's doing more than just cooling the oil. It's also bringing down your overall engine temperatures. And we all know that's a struggle with high power Miatas on the track. So do we have any more questions over there, Travis? Got a couple more, but they're a little off topic, so I think we should answer them. Okay, well, what I'm going to do now is we'll go on a walking tour of this car, and we'll talk about some of the ND coolers that we have specifically. And the ND is interesting because, as you may have heard, their transmissions are a little fragile. Um, they also have, uh, their differentials are fragile as well, and they have a very, very small fluid capacity on the differential specifically. Uh, the Global Cup cars at Long Road Racing, and I forget who's making them now, but the Global Cup cars that are out there, um, they all run dedicated transmission and differential coolers for longevity and, uh, and for, for strength. Um, I have seen a uh, Global Cup car race at Laguna Seca where all of a sudden one of the front runners just fell off the front of the pack and started effectively going backwards. And the reason it turns out was because his differential cooler had failed and the, tr and the temperature in his di differential was going up, friction was going up, the, um, the amount of lost energy was going up. Basically, in a, in a spec class where you're so closely matched on power, he started falling back to the pack because he was putting more of his power into heating up his differential than he was in actually putting the power to the ground. Um, also, of course, that put him at more risk of an actual differential failure because his oil was breaking down. We took this car, instrumented it up, and then ran it around our local track um, constantly. There's actually video of this, of this heat testing on YouTube. We had it instrumented in six different ways and, uh, and ran it to find out what the actual temperatures of the transmission and differential fluid are in track use. And we found out that it's terrifying. It's 300 degrees. Um, this thing, and it was turbocharged at the time, but even then we were running on small cart tracks. So we weren't putting down a huge amount of power, but just running out there for 10, 15 minutes, we had our differential and our transmission temperatures at 300 degrees, which as you noticed, is right where the seals start to go. The fluid is quite thin at that point. Um, it's not providing the protection. If you're gonna have a transmission failure, you're far more likely to have it under those conditions. And what was really scary was that parking the car, letting it sit for half an hour, didn't help. Uh, even getting on the interstate and driving home without a lot of load, but you know some theoretical airflow, didn't bring it down. The only thing that brought it down was a significant rest period 
you know, hours and hours of rest period so it could radiate the heat away before it could get down to, to temperature. Um, we also took this same car, we took it to Laguna Seca, the, the Miata reunion a few years back, and we ran it in every single run group for two days. It was 15 and a half hours of track time with pro driver, with journalists, with amateur racers, with amateur not even racers, with track day kind of drivers. We kept on passing the car over around and it ran non-stop turbocharged at that event and we had it instrumented again and with our coolers on, its uh, fluid temperatures were I think about 205. So we knocked 95 degrees off the temperature of the um, transmission and diff cooler or fluid with the addition of the flying meatic coolers, which we've never had a transmission or differential failure in this car. It's done a lot of really hard work. Related? Possibly. We'd like to think so. So let's have a look at this particular car, what we're dealing with here. Um, we have an oil cooler on it. One of these is the oil cooler. I'm going to say this one. So this is an oil cooler. They, they, as you can tell, they look very much alike. We're cooling something very similar. I'll give you some light there. Ooh. Uh, it is compatible, as you can see, with the BBR turbo intercooler. Um, it's also compatible. We have an adapter kit that allows it to be used with the Edelbrock supercharger if you feel the need to go that way. Um, but this is a nice solid Cetrab cooler that mounts in here. Again, thermostatically controlled, so it doesn't overcool the oil, and it sits very nicely in the nose of the car, it cools down the oil temperature. This is the transmission um, heat exchanger. Uh, this is what was responsible for dropping that temperature down by 95 degrees on track under sustained hard use. Um, if you run an ND on track, I would strongly recommend that you install coolers for the transmission and the differential. At the very least, it'll free up some power. Um, at best, it will save you a transmission or differential. Let's go underneath here and have a look at what's going on at the actual hookup. So I was extolling the virtues of thermostatic control earlier. And so the way we do it with the, this is the transmission one, obviously. Um, don't mind the extra instrumentation here. This is left over from when this thing was running. There's a lot of extra wires. But we have a temperature sensor in the, I guess it's the, the outlet from the transmission. Um, this is the hot fluid coming out. And there's a pump stashed up in there. We'll have a look at the pump in a little bit. Um, but it is, it is thermostatically controlled. So basically what we're doing is once the temperature gets above a certain point, do you know what the cutoff point is, um, Brennan? Oh, Brennan uh, is standing two, here. 200-ish. 200-ish, at approximately 200. Um, that's, it's probably right about where the, where the temperature was sitting at Laguna Seca, honestly. It's probably about 205. Um, once we get to that temperature, it turns the pump on, it starts running fluid through the cooler and returns it back into the fill plug. So this is actually very easy to bolt on. You don't need to modify the transmission case at all. Um, it is a literal bolt on. If you need to change the fluid, I'm gonna come around this way, Travis, you can have a look. You wanna change the fluid, you just undo this, this uh, bolt here on the, the banjo bolt, take that off, and then you can fill your fluid right there. So it's very easy to live with. Um, this is even protected by a nice little skid plate that Mazda gave us. Um, and everything is tucked away. I cannot show you the pump simply because it is hidden. Um, can we see it, Trav or Brandon? You can kind of see it right there. Everyone say hi, Brandon. Oh, it's right here. Oh, there's the pump. OK, <laughs> that is much easier. So there's the pump. Um, and and it also it runs a filter, which is, again, beneficial to your transmission because it is filtering out any microparticles that would not only damage the pump, but of course, transmissions are always making a mess. Um, so this will actually help your transmission live longer because it is filtering every single time the pump is running. So the pump is hidden up here uh, in front of the passenger side, the driver's side wheel. I think of which side you sit on in this country. Um, I have too many weird little cars. So there we go. So that's the transmission uh, setup. We'll come back here and look at the differential one, which is pretty slick. Uh, in this one, the heat exchanger is quite small. We're not putting as much heat through this thing as we are through the transmission because um, we're not changing the speeds quite so much. But uh, this one is kind of slick because it's actually, it's, it's built into this duct that Mazda put on here for a little bit of transmission uh, for a differential cooling. But we were able to mount it in there. And the actual differential casing itself, if you want to come around here, Travis, the actual differential casing itself, again, doesn't need modification. The one that they built for the Global Cup cars unfortunately does need modification. You cannot just attach it to a stock differential. Um, they have to weld on some fittings. We wanted to avoid that, so again, it uses the feed and drain plugs to, uh, to feed the lines. Again, extra wiring, that is not part of the kit. That is part of our instrumentation. There's a temperature sensor in here that we use for logging 
but this is the one that actually triggers the pump. Oh, actually, I'll take this off. Let's have a look at what's going on inside here. Put a little bracket, actually. In a moment, I will. I will unbox. Wow, it's full of junk. Uh, in just a moment, I will unbox one of these kits and we'll look at the at the component parts. But you can see there's the uh, there's the cooler. No parts, need, no extra drilling, no new holes. It all uses existing mounting points. Um, so we're actually pretty proud of how that uh, how that went in there. It was some good. Uh, Good work on Brandon's part. And the actual pump in this one is hidden up. I don't know if you can see it in there, Travis. Sorry, I probably just flashed the entire internet with the flashlight. Um, but the pump is stashed up underneath the trunk. So it's very well protected back there. Uh, I think, again, the Global Cup ones, I think it's actually in the trunk, which is fine for a race car. Uh, it's less acceptable for a, um, for a car that is intended for multi-purpose use. So let's go, uh, watch your head, Travis. Let's go have a look at what's in the box. Because this is kind of cool, sexy stuff. Hydraulic stuff is so cool looking. Do we have any more questions, Travis? We have two questions asking if the oil cooler will help fix the NC automatic transmission. We do not offer a kit for the, uh, for the NC at this point. Um, if you are having trouble with overheating, your NC automatic transmission, it's quite possible you could adapt this uh, because it uses those same, or it uses the, the, the drain and fill plugs. I suspect the NC transmission probably has the same um, fittings. I don't know about the automatic. I, honestly, I don't have a lot of experience with NC automatics. Automatics are not part of our usual uh, area of expertise. Um, but if you can fit it on there, it basically, it's an extra cooler. Now, auto, all automatic transmissions should have a cooler already, so you might want to make sure that maybe all you need is a bigger one. You replace it, because often they're built into the radiator. Maybe you can replace it with a bigger, separate transmission cooler. Talk to a towing shop. They know all about cooling transmissions, different uh, automatic transmissions. So, there's some wiring harness loom. There's some wires to put inside it. This is a cool little thing. This is the backing plate for the pump mount. It goes, you drill four little holes in your trunk, you drop this through, and so this is the part that's visible if you lift up the carpet in your trunk um, it's, that's bolted in. It's, it's, a, it's just such a cool little piece, I love it. Here's the pump itself, let's have a look at the pump. And I apologize, if you order one of these from Fly Me Out, it looks like someone has opened up the box and rooted around inside. Uh, this may be your kit. We will have it repacked by our shipping experts to make sure that I didn't lose anything but if you do get one of these and it looks like it's been opened up, that could very well be what's going on. Ooh, look at the pump. Seven gallons per minute, seven amps of pull and 50 PSI. That's a pretty hefty little pump. This thing actually has some, <laughs> if you're looking to save weight, this is not the first place to do it. Um, that is a serious little, little piece, but you can see it's got uh, vibration isolators on there. There's this little guy goes in here. That's basically how it's bolted into the, uh, into the trunk on the differential kit. This is actually the differential kit that I'm unboxing right now. Check out this crazy bracket. I have to give credit to our manufacturing partner in, uh, what are they, North Carolina, I think? Um, Kentucky, uh, who manufactures for us, because I would hate to have to try to build two of these with the same shape. But they somehow managed to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, not easy, I tell you. Not sure we're going to build one that shape. This is what you get for buying a, an off-the-shelf kit instead of rolling your own. There's a lot to be learned and a lot to, a lot to do by doing your own. But uh, in this particular case, take advantage. Now, in this case, we did have to go with uh, push-on hose. Um, so you do have to assemble these yourself. There's all sorts of, look at this. This is how our shipping department thinks. Um, that is... I mean, it could have been a Ziploc bag full of random hardware, but there we go. That is how they think. Everything is labeled. This is the sensor switch. Cute little thing, so that just sits in there. And we do sell an inline sensor, an inline adapter that goes into, I've probably got one in here somewhere, goes into a Dash 8 line um, that lets you actually monitor temperature in any fluid that happens to be running through a Dash 8 line. So that is one place you could put an oil cooler sensor is you could add one of our sensor adapters. It's very shallow, so 
Yeah, Brandon's back there giving me extra information. It is, you do have to watch out. It's a very shallow. Um, the adapter is very shallow, so yes, you may you do have to make sure that whatever sensor you're using clears. This one does. Um, I don't know where my adapter is. Look at it, uh, this, these guys crack me up. Look at that: two fuses, two butt connector, three butt connectors, two spade connectors, and a ring connector. All nicely done up. And there's an inline fuse. Anyhow, this is full of all the bits and pieces you need to make a good push-on hose, including the special one-use clamps that are used to, to close it up afterwards. The shipping guys are probably sitting there watching this and crying because I'm messing up all of their work. You've not received a package from Fly Me Out. You do not know how, how much pride that your parts arrive safely and completely. It's, uh, it's very nice from a customer service standpoint not to have to second guess what was in a box. Every once in a while, out of you know, thousands of packages a month, we'll have one error but I gotta tell you, their success rate is huge. It's great. There we go. Here is the filter, and this actually has a replaceable element, or at least a cleanable element in it, I believe. 240 micron, yep. So this is far cleaner than your, you know, your, your differential normally doesn't have a filter on it. Your transmission doesn't usually have a filter on it. So this is a really nice little addition to the kit in that it also, not only does it cool your your fluid, but it also makes sure that it is filtered of any element larger than 240 microns. If you've ever done a transmission fluid change, you know how much stuff is stuck on that magnetic, that magnetic pickup. Well, this keeps it from going through your transmission quite so much. It gets trapped in here. It means one more step when you're doing a fluid change, but let's just look at that. A little stainless steel filter in there. So that will be cleanable. Um, you could also replace it, but if you clean it well, you should be okay. Do any more questions, Travis? I'm waving sexy looking pieces around. Uh, all the other parts that are in here are some heat shielding, yes. loom. Oh, that's actually heat shrink. Yes, Sorry. Heat shrink to clean up the braid. This is heat shrink to clean up the braid, so, this which we have not done. <laughs> this is done with electrical tape on this car. That's the, the life of development car. This is actually special durable stuff for anywhere yeah they are extra extra strong heat shrink protector or um, protector for the various hoses because there's no point in having the thing you installed to protect your transmission take out your transmission because you wore through a line and it dumps all of its fluid all of the track uncool so that's the differential kit I might open up the transmission kit although it looks very much the same the only real difference is the brackets are different and the hose lengths are different but fundamentally it's the same concept so maybe I won't bother opening that up because because you got to see this, and this is cool. It can also be used as a Star Wars toy of some description. Yeah. Maybe we should. Now nah, Disney would probably sue us if yeah. we did that. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't go there. <laughs> Sorry, Disney. You're taking all the fun out of things. Do we have any more questions? Even if they are unrelated, Travis. Question about a coolant reroute. Question about a coolant reroute. Well, that is a different matter. We actually did a. A, uh, a pretty good video a little while back. Mike ran through coolant reroutes, the theory behind them, what's going on there. So I am going to defer to Mike's video on the coolant reroute. So I'm going to look at some of the questions that folks sent in ahead of time. Um, doo -doo -doo, are they really necessary with NAs and MBs with stock internals and boost? It's, that's going to depend on basically how much heat you're putting into that engine. Uh, and also how much you want in terms of a... a um, my brain just turned off. Margin of error, I guess you'll say, a safety margin. You know, it, on, on street use, it's unlikely you'll need it most of the time. Um, but if you do need it, it's good to have it. Uh, if you're putting a lot of heat into the engine, um, that oil cooler will help bring it down. If you are running it on the track, it doesn't matter if you only go to the track once a year, what happens during that day is gonna be important. Um, so, you know, your oil coolers don't care if you go to the track every weekend or if you go to the track once every six, we every six years. It's what, uh, on that day, you need to make sure that your oil temperatures are under control and your engine coolant temperatures and your brakes are up to it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, here's an interesting question. This is from someone who obviously was, uh, has been around for a while because I asked about our twin cooler. And this was an interesting experiment that we tried years ago. We built the radiator. And I think Mazda Motorsports has actually 
come around on this one, but this is back around 2003, 2004. We built the radiator where the core wasn't quite as long and it had an oil cooler stuck on the end. And we even actually did a version that had a hole in it so we could put an intercooler pipe through. It was a mad scientist time, let me tell you. Um, so that was great. It, it gave us a very, very good location for an oil cooler. The problem was, in order to do that, we had to give up water cooling size. And it was very expensive, just because it was difficult to produce relative to you know, buying one of these off the shelf and producing a single sort of a classic radiator. So that is why we moved away from that one. One was because of simply we, needed as, we wanted as much radiator core area as possible, and also because it was just simply a little expensive for what it was. Cool thing though, it was very, very neat. The old FM4 used to use one of those with the, they probably built six of them, but the, uh, with the intercooler pipe going right through the radiator was an awesome thing. Why are the two cooler, coolers in the photo? I think we've shown that. Uh, do we need to prime the cooler to ensure it doesn't airlock if you mount it high up front? Now, the cooler itself won't airlock because it's got, it's got a place for the air to go. So you're, you're going to fill this up all the way. It's going to come out there. Um, the pumps on the transmission ones, the transmission differential, they are self-priming. They can pull up to, I think it's three feet or something. It's, it's, they are very strong little pumps. Um, so they will pull the fluid up. They will prime themselves. So there's basically there's no worry about priming these things. Um, obviously, with an engine oil cooler, you have the engine oil pump. Um, taking care of that, so there's no worries there. Most of these are uh, questions about, do I need one? Do I need one? I wish I had a, a specific thing where I said, if you do this thing, then you need a cooler. If you don't do this thing, you don't need a cooler. But really, it all comes down to how hard are you pushing that car? How much heat are you putting into it? And are you tracking an ND? Because if you are tracking ND, the answer is you really probably want a transmission and differential oil cooler. They're not cheap. Um, you know, the... We have our, our totally cool kit, which has all the parts in there. Um, but the uh, the oil cooler kit for the ND is 589, free shipping. Um, the transmission kit is 969, and the differential cooler is 1079. That is the the price right now. When you watch this video, if you're watching on YouTube or something, that may have changed. Um, and the main reason for that is that pump. That little pump is an amazing, stupendous little piece of kit, but it's not cheap. It's cheaper than a differential, though. Unless, well, cheaper than losing a track day and having to tow your car home and then putting a new differential in it. If you're just chucking old, uh, you know, 1.6 open diffs in there, yeah, you can get those for 75 bucks. So cheaper than those. But um, those are cheaper. But if you are, you know, if reliability is important to you, that is unfortunately the cost of making the ND rear end and transmission more reliable under hard use. Any more questions, Travis? Will this be available on YouTube later? This will be available, at, well, well, that could be a weird question. Somebody might be watching this on YouTube right now. Um, yes, this is Facebook Live. When we are done with it, like uh, all, of our, uh, all of our Facebook Live videos, we will put it on YouTube on our youtube.com slash video uh, channel. We have videos going back well, since the beginning of YouTube, basically some of them much better than others, uh, but there's all sorts of interesting content in there, including all of our Facebook Live videos are archived on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're going, yeah, I know that. How do you think I got here? Uh, if I yeet my car into a wall trying to be Ken Block, will the oil cooler survive? Depends on which it hits first. Well, that's true. Excellent point. If you are, if you are using oversteer, if you are hanging the back tail out like Ken Block is wanted to do, then the oil cooler is probably safe. If you're trying to do one of those bozozoku, whatever style Japanese things where you put the oil cooler at the very front of the car, I wouldn't even park in New York City with one of those things. It'd be terrible. You'd destroy that right away. That is style over substance right there. Um, if you put them inside the bumper, you do have the bumper support structure to help a little bit, but I would strongly recommend if you yeet into a wall. Uh, I must admit I'm old enough. I don't know if that's a typo or if I'm just, you know, that's the kids these days. Um, anyway, if you do drive into a wall, I would recommend checking for oil leakage before you fire up and go yeeting away um, to do a more Ken Block work. Ken Black, I would like to point out, not only has a lot of money, he does multiple takes. He doesn't do that all at once. Kids, don't try to be Ken Black. It's too expensive. <sighs> I'm running a fully built Walter Motorsports transmission for my ND. I think I know who this is. Would running a trans cooler prolong the life of the transmission? And the answer is almost definitely. Um, the Walter Motorsports transmissions, they're basically they're built transmissions. This car actually has a built transmission as well. It's running a global cup car specification trans with the upgraded third and fourth gear from Emco, um, you, still need the cool, you still need your fluid to hold together. That transmission is still going to be running close to 300 degrees if you're running on track. Um, 
you're still pushing your, your uh, transmission fluid way beyond its design point. So yes, I would strongly recommend, if you're at the point where you're running a built transmission for your ND, you should be running coolers for that thing as well to protect your investment, because those things aren't cheap. So, um, lots of questions about airflow to the various coolers. Obviously, <laughs> we have a stack, how many, air, how many heat exchangers are in this poor thing? Um, three, four, five, six in the diff, there's got to be a, well, I was going to say there's a power steering cooler. There's no power steering cooler. There's an no, D. It's <laughs> and an electric, yeah, the electric motor is self-cooling. Um, but yeah, you're, you're pumping all this, all this heat in. You need to get as much airflow over them as possible, and that means airflow in and airflow out. Again, we get back to our differential pressures that we've talked over and over again. That's why this car has, as you can probably see, it has hood, hood uh, louvers in it. Hood vents, and we have done a video on hood vents specifically, as well as uh, fender vents, as to why you need them. And that's one of the reasons, is to promote the airflow through this stack of heat exchangers. All that, all that gasoline that you're burning is mostly turning into heat. And this is what you're doing, trying to get rid of it. And then you throw an air conditioner in there just to keep the little bag of meat behind the wheel comfortable. It's, it's a terrible thing. So yes, you want your coolers where they can get as much airflow as possible, but you don't want them to completely obstruct the other heat exchangers you have in the car. Um, another reason why we put our old cooler for the NA and Bs down here was because it's not obstructing any of that airflow, and it's enough to take the edge off the oil. Um, if you're really running the car hard and you're not running air conditioning, you have room to put something else, go ahead and build a custom bracket. Um, but there we go. So I think I've covered most of it. Um, please do go to the Fly Me Out of website to get up-to-date uh, up pricing information and specification information on these, on these kits. Uh, we will be happy to answer any questions you might have. And Travis, I believe there may be a question right now. Uh, there was one question in that stack about if we were going to offer a power steering cooler and why or why not and maybe use them. Power steering cooler. Well, not for the ND. Um, actually, we do have an ND with a power steering cooler, our V8 ND, because it runs hydraulic power steering. It actually has a power steering cooler on it. Um, and actually, a lot of a lot of Miatas actually have a factory power steering cooler of sorts. It's just basically a little loop. Um, it's enough to take the edge off. Again, if you are having trouble with overheating your power steering fluid, first off, Redline makes a very good power steering fluid. Um, I would recommend that. We don't have plans to make a power steering cooling kit at the moment. Uh, I'm not going to say that that may never happen, uh, but at the moment, it's not something we're working on. So I can certainly see if you are having trouble with boiling your power steering fluid, uh, autocrossers do stuff like this all the time. Autocrossers have been dumping power steering fluid into their engine bay since 1990 on Miatas. Um, and if you are overheating your power steering fluid on track, then it may be something you want to consider is at least putting in one of the factory ones, or there are lots of off-the-shelf options out there. Um, they may not, they're more universal than Miata specific, but you can always use one of those. They don't need to be huge. Um, power steering coolant doesn't get the same sort of heat load that oil does, for example, so you can use this pretty small, you've seen them on the wall of your local Napa, uh, fairly small coolers. But they're pretty effective. They, they take the edge off pretty quickly, and that's usually all you need. I think that's all I've got going on in here. Um, if you have any questions that have not been answered in this video, please do put them in the comments, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube. Um, simply yelling them at your screen will unfortunately not work. We don't have the technology for that yet. So please put them in the comments. We will answer them in the comments. And uh, enjoy the track. Enjoy your Miata. We will be back next week. Thanks for your attention.